Hello and welcome to the Education Connection Day for the Midland Storytelling Festival. This program provides content for secondary level grades 7 through 12. Our tellers today are Donna Washington of Durham, North Carolina and Bill Lapp of Charleston, West Virginia. As you listen to their stories, notice the difference in their artistic styles, how they communicate and tell a story. Then, as you think about your own communication skills, realize that if you can think it and speak it, then you can write it. Let's listen. When I was a kid, I lived in South Korea. And I have six brothers and sisters. I have four brothers and two sisters. And my father is in the United States Army. At least he was when I was a kid. He was a lieutenant colonel. But at the time this story took place, he was a captain. Now, I have no idea if anyone has ever lived in a haunted house. I mean, if you have, raise your hand. Everyone around, around the room can look and see if you have lived in a haunted house. And if you have, then I'm sure you've got great stories about it. Well, I have had the crazy, odd, I don't know, joy <laughs> of living in two haunted houses in my life. One of them I lived in as an adult and one as a kid. Now, I personally did not know either one of them was haunted until I moved in there. Now, the second one happened when I was an adult. We rented, um, uh, we rented a house in Wake Forest when we first moved here from the Chicago area. And I was back in the back room and I felt a cold spot in the room. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. Just a spot that's really cold. And if you are from the South, you know that um, haints, like spooky things, they will leave cold spots in your house. So at least that's what they say. So I saw there was a cold spot. And about a week later, I was outside washing the car. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw the front door open and close. And I thought that there was, uh, my husband was standing on the porch. And when I looked over there, there was nobody there. Hmm. Well, I kept washing my car. And about half an hour, it happened again. Half an hour later, the door opened. Someone stepped out onto the front porch. I assumed it was my husband. There is no other grown up in the house. And I look and there's nobody there. And I thought, okay, so. There's a cold spot in the back of the room. Clearly, whatever this thing is, comes down the hall and comes out the front door. Not a problem. It's not doing anything. It can stay there, I don't care. Well, my son started walking in this house and it was a one level house, except uh, the kitchen was here. And then as you went sort of around this little uh, wall, there was two little steps up that would take you back into the back room. And, and he started walking early. I, I called him a walking idiot because he was like 10 months old and he got up and started walking and he'd forget him, he'd fall down. So I was con confused, I was concerned, not confused, I was concerned that he would like come down these two little steps and go take a header right into this wall. However, it was one of those weird things. Every time I would see him going over there, I would kind of run over and it always looked like he kind of floated down the steps. Now, I know he wasn't floating down the steps. He was walking down the steps, but it looked like he was floating. And we have one of those photographs from when he was little where we took a picture and he's looking off to one side and you see those like glowy lights sort of away from his head. And it looks like he's looking at something and it's those little glowy lights. Anyway, that was the second haunted house I lived in. The first one I lived in was when I was a kid and I was living in South Korea in a place called RGH, the Rental Government Housing. And it actually, it was really RGH8, which for the longest time, we just thought was the A part was just because the, that's how the South Koreans were pronouncing the H, like H. But it actually was an A, the Rental Government Housing Area. And the area that we lived in had, so people said, been a battlefield at one point. So the South Koreans refused to build anything there because they said there were ghosts there. But when the Americans came, they said, oh yeah, you can build your houses over there, not a problem. So they built all these duplexes and apartments on this land. Now, as you know, a duplex is a house that's divided so that you have one house on one side and one house on the other and they share a wall in between. After we moved in, the uh, four brothers and, you know, 
three sisters, well, two sisters, all right, some of us. Once we moved in, um, well, people started telling us stories about our haunted duplex. We apparently lived in the most haunted duplex in the whole area. The kids who had already lived there told us that at night you could see a light going from one end of the duplex all the way to where our kitchen was and then just disappearing. And it looked like the light was passing through the walls. So someone was walking up and down our halls, actually going through our rooms, across past the windows all night long, pacing back and forth. And they also said that our house, if you stayed overnight at our house and you went to the bathroom at the wrong hour, like witching hour, which I think is like two o'clock in the morning, a hand would come out of the toilet and grab your butt. That's what they said. They also said that our house was the house in which if you looked in the mirror and you said Bloody Mary, she would be right behind you. That's the house that we lived in. Seven kids in this house. Now, my dad is six foot four. He has black belts in judo, karate, hapkido, tensudo, and taekwondo. He has, uh, he knows how to use uh, nunchucks and swords. And the army thought it was a fabulous idea to teach him how to shoot rifles. So we weren't worried about being in that house because my dad was scarier than anything that could be in there. My dad is also the blackest human being I've ever seen in my life. He looks like midnight with eyeballs. And he has a really sweet voice, but he always looks like he's about to rip something apart. So people always said we were lucky that my dad was our da my dad because like the scary things would be too scared of him. Now, I lived in South Korea in the 70s, which meant the electric grid was terrible. And every now and again, you know, the lights would go out and we'd have a blackout or a brownout. Now, what this meant was every weekend, every kid in the neighborhood wanted to spend the night at our house. We want to stay with the Washingtons. We want to stay with the Washingtons because they were in a haunted house. What if the power went out? Wouldn't that be cool? Well, the way it worked is we were in the 70s. We were free range children. So, my, you know, in the weekends, usually starting Friday evening all the way through Sunday, my mother would sort of send us out of the house and we'd go running, tearing around the neighborhood. And there was always a game to play. There was someone playing kickball or capture the flag or, or touch football or something. There was always something going on. So you could just join one of the games. There'd be like, you know, 50 kids running around doing stuff. We played frozen statues where one of the big kids swings everyone around and you have to freeze however you, you land. And then um, someone comes, one of the kids pretends they're trying to buy a statue and they turn you on and you have to do something, uh, make you know, jokes or run around or do flips or whatever it is. And then after it's over, the kid who was doing the shopping would decide which was the best statue and they would buy that statue. Anyway, we played those kind of games. But in the evening, the mothers would come out on the porch and they would start calling their kids. Now, my mom had seven kids and she baked in these and she cooked in these giant pots. But on Friday and Saturday night, she always had more than seven because half the neighborhood would come running to our house and go, can we eat dinner here? And my mother would go, okay, call your parents. And of course we had the phone that's hooked to the wall. So there'd be this long line of kids. Can we stay, can we stay, can we stay, can we stay? Yes, no, no, yes, no, no. And so at any given point on Friday and Saturday night, there were 15 kids at our house, which is okay. Cause my mother baked, you know, cooked in these big pots. So she'd cook and cook and cook and kids would eat and eat and eat. And then they wouldn't leave. They would hang out and there would be board games brought out or books brought out or we'd be chatting. And then my mother would finally just get to a point and she'd say, go home. And then of course they'd all go, can we stay? Can we stay? And she'd say, call your mothers. And there'd be another line. Can we stay at the Washingtons? Can we stay at the Washingtons? Can we stay at the Washingtons? Yes, no, yes, no. And then they would all leave or some of them would leave. And eventually there'd be like 12 kids at our house. So on Friday and Saturday nights, there'd be anywhere from 10 to 12 kids, sometimes a little more, especially if you're having a party, then you invite kids to come. And there came, I think it was like a Saturday night, when so many kids had ended up at dinner. And I think that as time went on, parents would be like, I bet they'll eat at the Washingtons. Let's go out to dinner. <laughs> and so then they, we'd end up with all these extra kids who said, yes, you know, parents said, yes, you could stay. So we had a whole bunch of kids at our house. There, there's just a ton of them, I had 15, like more than double what was normally there. So my mother, of course, she made these big food and, and she'd made spaghetti and she's just scooping out spaghetti. And there were so many kids and they were eating so voraciously. She actually emptied one of those pots. I mean, 
people were coming back for thirds and, and there was no more garlic bread, there was no more spaghetti. And she was worried that she hadn't fed everybody enough. So she got this idea. She said she'd make apple turnovers. So she goes in the kitchen. She's making apple turnovers. We're all sitting in the family room. We're playing games or whatever. My dad is sitting in this giant lazy boy chair. And he's this giant man sitting in this giant chair. And while we're sitting in there, my mother comes in. She sits at the table and whoosh, the lights go out. A blackout. And all the kids go, ah! And they start running. And my mother says, stop. And we all stop. Get back over here. We all get, sit down. We sit down. <sighs> we're in the haunted house and we're in a blackout. So immediately, we start telling stories about this house. We start telling stories about all the scary stuff that supposedly happened and the warriors walking around like decapitating people. We're just freaking ourselves out. And my mother is not helping. She's got all these candles and she's got a lighter and she's lighting all the candles, which means now there's like flickering yellow and red light running up and down the hall walls. And, and we're talking and then someone says, well, that's okay. It doesn't matter what's in here because Captain Washington's in here. And we all look over and the chair is empty. Now, my father is a huge man. Sneaking is not one of his best skills, but he's gone. What happened? What happened to Captain Washington? Then we hear a bang and everyone goes, ah, and starts running. My mother says, stop running, get back over here. We get back over there. Now we're all sitting around, <sighs> what's happening? And down the hall we hear, bang, 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 bang. And it's like something is coming down the hall. And my father comes around the corner and he's wearing his gi, which is a martial arts outfit and it's completely white. And he's got a flashlight under his face, which is like light streaming up. But he's so dark, you can barely see his skin. And his eyeballs look like they're floating in the air. And he says, all right. And he comes in the room and we realize he's wearing his samurai sword. And he says, everyone sit in a circle. So we sit in a circle. He said, everyone make room for me. So we make room for him. And my dad puts the flashlight pump right in the middle of the circle. Big light cascading up onto the ceiling, red and orange light flickering all over the walls. And my father says, you have been telling stories about the evil in this house. And we said, yeah, we have. And my father says, all the stories are true. And we say, we know. And he says, have you ever wondered why you never have problems in this house? And we go, why? And my father said, it's because of this. And he holds up his samurai sword in its sheath and he says, a long time ago, I saved the life of a Japanese samurai. And he was an old man. When I met him, I saved his life. And five years later, he called me back to his home. He told me he had no sons and he gifted me the sword. And he told me that the ancestors of the samurai are now with us. And that is why you're always protected in this house. And then he unsheathed the sword, shing, and held it up to the light. You could see the orange and red light flickering up and down the blade. And he says, I call upon the ancestors, the samurai ancestors, to be with everyone in this house, shing. And he sheathes the sword. And he holds it up and he says, I'm going to pass it around. And when I do, everyone who touches it will absorb one of the samurai ancestors and you'll be safe from the evil in this house. And my father starts passing that sword around and everyone's touching it. And I got worried because I was sitting next to him on this side and that sword had to go all the way around the circle. And I was like, what if, what if, what if all of the samurai ancestors are gone before it gets to me? And they kept passing it around and finally it was my turn and I held on to it. And I was hoping there was one little bitty samurai left in there. My father takes the sword and he unsheathes it again, shing! And he says, if the spirit of the samurai are with us, send us a sign, bang! The buzzer went off on the stove in the kitchen and we freak out, ah! And my mother says, stop, we stop, sit still, we sit still. <sighs> Why? Why did the samurai ancestors set off the buzzer on the stove? And five minutes later, my mother came back into the room with hot apple turnovers that had been cooked in a blackout. And she handed out these hot apple pies with the little icing on it. And we sat in the dark with the lights flickering up and down the walls, eating apple turnovers. And we knew, we knew that the samurai ancestors had cooked the apple turnovers in the middle of a blackout to prove to us that they were watching over us. Yeah, we were little at that point. We did not understand residual heat. We just understood that our apple turnovers had been cooked. Now, throughout my life, I have had various struggles. And whenever I get really scared, I imagine all of my ancestors standing behind me, holding you know, 
uh, their arms together, like, you know, link their arms to be sitting, be behind me to keep me safe. And there are, there's a uh, Tuskegee Airmen in my lineage and Buffalo soldiers and people who marched in the civil rights. And I imagine all these beautiful black people standing there keeping me safe. And amongst them all, there is one little samurai warrior who looks just as fierce and he's holding up a hot apple turnover. And that is the story of Samurai Over My Head. <laughs> Afghanistan, Albania, Algeria, Angola, Antigua, and Barbuda, Aruba, Austria, Australia, Azerbaijan. Imagine the fifth grade hanging around the perimeter of our gymnasium. There were flags from different countries from all around the world and they were hung in alphabetical order. And our fifth grade teacher, Mr. Woodcraft, decided that each student needed to learn an alphabetical list of the countries. Now, we didn't each have to learn all the countries, we just got one chunk of countries. And then we had to pick one of those countries and write a report on the culture and history of that country. And this was all gonna culminate, we were gonna go in the gym on a Friday night, our adults were gonna be there, we were gonna eat food, and then each student would stand up and recite their list of countries. And as they recited their list of countries, they would point at the corresponding flag, and then they would read their report. So the first kid would be like, Austria, Australia, Azerbaijan. <laughs> I did my report on the country of Australia. Australia is a country, it is a continent. It is an island. It is in the ocean. People live there. Because that is what you sound like when you do public speaking. And then each child, adult, would think to themselves, oh, our child is the smartest, brightest, most creative child in the whole school system. And all of those adults would be wrong, except mine. So, every day in class, we had to stand up and recite our list of countries. We were in there one day and the girl got up through the last several letters of the alphabet and she said, Venezuela, Vietnam, Virgin Islands, Wake Islands, West Germany, Yemen, Yugoslavia, Zambia, Zimbabwe. And when she got all done, my buddy Wally raised his hand. And he said, excuse me, Mr. Woodcraft, what about Wallace and Fatuna? And Mr. Woodcraft said, well, what about Wallace and Fatuna? And Wally said, Wallace and Fatuna is a country. It's an island country located in the South Pacific between Fiji and Samoa. Mr. Woodcraft said, I don't think Wallace and Fatuna is a country. And Wally said, Wallace and Fatuna is a country. I know it's a country because my parents were in the Peace Corps. They met on Wallace and Fatuna. They fell in love. They got married. They had me. And I am named for the country of Wallace and Fatuna. Wally said, my name is Wallace Fatuna Fenstermacher. And Mr. Woodcraft said, that be as it may, I don't think it's a country. And Wally said, it is a country, I know it's a country, and I demand that you formally recognize Wallace and Fatuna as a country. And Mr. Woodcraft said, we don't have a flag for Wallace and Fatuna in our gym, therefore I refuse to formally recognize Wallace and Fatuna as a country. And this, young people, unfortunately sums up American diplomatic policy. If your flag does not hang in the gymnasium of a rural American school, you don't exist that all there is to it. So, Wally had said, I demand you formally recognize. Mr. Woodcraft had said, we don't have a flag, I refuse to formally recognize. This was back in the 1980s when we had the superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And a tiny little country like Wallace and Fatuna didn't stand much of a chance in a full frontal assault on a superpower. So Wally knew that he wasn't beaten. He just had to step back and wait for the winds of political change to shift so that he could press his point at a later date. So, we went to gym. Now, our gym teacher was a woman named Ms. Grunkle. And uh, nothing about her said physical or education, except her outfit. She wore standard 1980s gym teacher clothing. She had a white polo buttoned all the way up to the bottom of her chin, polyester gym teacher shorts with three metal buttons, tube socks pulled all the way up to her knees, prescription tennis shoes, a whistle, and a bullhorn. What? And she only communicated to us through the bullhorn. So if we were in the hallway, she would say things like, don't run. 
And if we were in the gym, she would say things like, run! It was very conflicting information. And I believe that she could walk. I think that she was ambulatory. She just chose not to. She had a little three-wheeled electric scooter, and everywhere in the whole wide world that she went, she went on that scooter. And if there was some place she couldn't go on that scooter, she didn't want to go to that place anyway. So we would go to the gym, she would get on her bullhorn, and she would say, line up on your numbers. And we would go and stand on our assigned number. And she would drive her scooter over to a metal cart on top of which sat a record player. She'd get out an album called, like, The Joys of Calisthenics put that on the record player, drop the needle, and we would hear a cheery voice that would say, let's do jumping jacks. Feet, shoulder width apart, hands on your thighs, palms out, ready, one, two, three. And as Grumpa would drive back and forth yelling at us, left, you call that a jumping jack, fetch your mother, you're falling behind. Bart, show some enthusiasm. And this is why some of your friend's parents chose to homeschool. But when that was done, we would go and sit around the rope. Now, when I was in elementary school, when many of the adults in this room were in elementary school, hanging from the ceiling of every gymnasium in America, four stories above the ground, there was a rope. It came all the way down from the ceiling to about a foot off the floor. It had a tremendous knot tied in the bottom of it. And as part of our physical education, we were supposed to climb to the top of that rope, touch the ceiling, and then climb all the way back down. Very few students could climb all the way to the top of that rope. Fewer still could climb back down. So what would happen is some poor kid would get up there four stories above the ground, touch the ceiling, and then one of two things would occur. They would either sort of let go of the rope, at which point they would come down the rope at about 708 miles an hour. And by the time they got to the bottom, there'd be nothing left but some blisters, some ashes, and some calluses. Or they would entirely let go of the rope, at which point they'd be like, And you'd think when they hit the ground, they'd go, but no, our teachers were concerned for our physical well-being. So they put a mat underneath that rope. And that mat was at least as thick as my t-shirt. So when you hit, you only broke most of your bones, not all of your bones. So we would go and sit around that mat. And we would sit in what you now call huh, crisscross applesauce on your bottoms, children. And why an entire generation of American children has applesauce on their bottoms, I don't know. But we would sit in a big circle, and a weird game of duck, duck, goose would commence. Because Miss Grumpa would be like, left, climb the rope. Now, I have never been particularly athletic nor coordinated, but I could get my hands on the rope. I could get my feet on the knot. And that's as high as I could get. And I went and sat down, and she said, Bart, climb the rope. And Skeeter could get his hands on the rope, his feet on the knot. He could climb to his feet were maybe 18 inches above the knot. And then he slid down and sat down. And then she said, Fern Dale, climb the rope. Now, Fern was a girl in our class, kind of a snooty, snotty little girl, kind of girl you might find in the middle of the woods, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a clearing with a cauldron and a fire. <laughs> Saying things like rats, tails, dogs, eyes, I hope all boys die. And Fern, Fern wasn't any stronger than the rest of us, but she got up, grabbed hold of the rope, got her feet up and on, and Fern started to climb. And Fern got to where her feet were maybe eight feet off the ground, and she just froze. I don't know if she got scared, or if she ran out of strength, or if it was a combination of both, but she was just locked with her feet eight feet off the ground. And Miss Grumple, in her kind and compassionate way, was driving around yelling, Fern Dale, climb up or climb down, Fern Dale, climb up or climb down. And the more she yelled at poor Fern, the more upset poor Fern got. And when Fern got upset, she started to cry. And when she started to cry, her nose started to run. And pretty soon her face was covered in tears and snot. And she needed to wipe her face. But her hands were way up here. She couldn't get her face up to her hands. She couldn't get her hands down to her face. But she needed to wipe her face. So finally she was just like, <laughs> right? on the rope. Well, those ropes were, were made out of raw jute, steel wool, and barbed wire. 
And the rope just cut poor Fern's face and the tears started to roll in. And now Fern was really crying. And Miss Grunkle decided that she was going to have to be more proactive in rescuing Fern. But she wouldn't get off of her scooter. So she was trying to drive it up onto the mat. But she was right beside the mat. And the scooter was rear wheel drive. And she didn't have enough power. She was like, <laughs> So then she backed up like 15 feet, got a good head of steam, came flying in, hit this side of the mat, flew right over the mat, landed on the three kids on the other side, just bam, took them out. They were gone. The janitor came in, sprinkled some of that red stuff on them, got the big mop, pushed them away. We never spoke to those children. And then Miss Grunkle figured out that she could back up onto the mat, but she still wasn't tall enough to reach Fern. So finally, she called Mr. Woodcraft, and he came and got Fern down. And Fern got to do what every child got to do in the 1980s when they were upset at school. Fern got to go to the bathroom, wash her face with cold water, get a Kleenex, come back in, sit down, and deal with it. And then, Miss Grunkle said, Fenstermacher, climb the roof. And that's Wally. You remember Mr. Wallace's platoon of Fenstermacher. And Wally was one of these kids. You hear people say, oh, he can't sit still. Wally could barely sit. Some kid of that, some part of that kid's body was always going 100 miles an hour. It was usually his mouth. He might not even be talking, but his mouth would be going. And if he shut his mouth, some other part of his body had to take over. If you grab that hand, this hand started going. If you grab that hand, this foot started going. There was no potential energy about Wally. Wally was pure kinetic energy. Nowadays, they give you something for that. Back then, we just let kids go. And when Miss Grunkle said, Fester Mager climbed the rope, we never even saw him get up. Wally went from sitting crisscross applesauce on his bottom, he just went <laughs> And he hit that rope about nine feet up. And we've never seen it happen before, but Wally climbed clear to the ceiling. He touched the ceiling, and then Wally climbed all the way back down. And when Wally's feet hit the knot at the bottom of the rope, Wally went right back up. And he was going down and up and down and up. And Miss Grunkle was saying, Fester Mager, what are you doing, Fester Mager? And Wally said, I'm climbing the rope, I'm climbing the rope. And Miss Grunkle said, Fester Mager, quit climbing the rope. Well, Wally was an obedient child. Just because you can't quit moving doesn't mean you're not an obedient child. And when Miss Grunkle said, Fester Mager, quit climbing the rope, Wally quit climbing the rope. But when Miss Grunkle said, Fester Mager, quit climbing the rope, Wally was at the top of the rope. So there he was, four stories above the ground. And Miss Grunkle said one of those, let's face it, stupid things that adults say to children. She said, Fester Mager, you're in a lot of trouble. You come down right now and get your punishment. Where was Wally? Uh, where was the punishment? Down. Would you come down? No. No, you would not. And Wally didn't say anything. I know what he was thinking. He was thinking, ha uh I'm not coming down. And you sure aren't coming up. <laughs> And Miss Grunkle said, Fester Mugger, if you don't come down right now, I'm going to call Mr. Woodcraft. And again, while I didn't say anything, by no he's thinking, call Mr. Woodcraft. He's not coming up here either. And pretty soon, Mr. Woodcraft was in the gym. Fester Mugger, you come down right now, you're getting on my last nerve. While he didn't say anything. Instead, what he did was, the ceiling of our gymnasium was held up by big metal trusses, like big ladders turned on their sides, every 24 inches, all the way down the entire length of the ceiling of the gym. And the rope was tied to one of those trusses way at that end of the gym. And when Mr. Woodcraft said, Fenster Mocker, come down right now, Wally didn't say anything. He just let go of the rope with one hand, grabbed hold of that metal truss, let go of the rope with the other hand, grabbed hold of that metal truss, did a pull-up, and Wally was in the ceiling. <laughs> and Mr. Woodcraft said, Fenster Mocker, you better think about what you're doing. And Wally thought about it, and he reached down, and he grabbed the rope. Now nobody was going to get Wally down. So they called the principal, and the principal came down, and the principal and Mr. Woodcraft and Ms. Grunkle were over there, a dog, to do to do to do trying to figure out what to do. And finally they figured out that Wally needed rescues. 
And they thought, who in our community is responsible for rescuing people? And pretty soon the volunteer fire department came running in the gym. And one of the firemen had an extension ladder and he put it up underneath Wally and he started to climb and he got about halfway up and Wally let himself down so he was hanging from the ceiling and he just monkey barred clear to that end of the gym. And when he got to that end of the gym, he did a pull-up and he was in the ceiling. And the fireman took his ladder, went to that end of the gym, put it up underneath Wally, started to climb, got about halfway up. Wally let himself down, monkey barred back down to this end of the gym. So Wally was monkey barring back and forth, the fireman was running back and forth, Miss Grover was driving back and forth. Pastor Mocker, you better come down right now. Pretty soon the fire department figured out they weren't going to get Wally. They figured out that Wally didn't need rescue. People who need rescued need rescued because they don't have any other avenue of escape. Wally had plenty of avenues of escape. Wally didn't need rescued. Wally needed trapped. And the adults thought, who in our community is responsible for trapping things? And pretty soon the dog catcher came running into the gym. He had that big net on that log stick, but it wasn't nearly long enough to catch Wally. So he went out to his truck. And he came back in, and he had a long, thin, rectangular box, and he put it on the ground, and he flipped some latches, and he opened it up, and there was a tranquilizer gun. <laughs> and he started to tell us what a tranquilizer gun was, but we didn't need anyone to tell us what a tranquilizer gun was, because we had grown up watching a television show called Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And every week on that show, there was this guy named Jim, and he'd be like in the back of a pickup truck, bouncing across the African savanna, chasing a white rhinoceros with a tranquilizer gun. And this other guy, Marlon Perkins, safe in New York City, would be saying, now Jim is going to shoot the white rhinoceros with a tranquilizer dart. And he's put just enough tranquilizer in the dart to subdue the white rhinoceros, but not kill the white rhinoceros. Be careful, Jim. And the humane officer was saying to us, I'm going to put just enough tranquilizer in this dart to subdue Wally, but not kill Wally. <laughs> Wally was hanging four stories above the ground. It didn't matter how much tranquilizer you hit him with, he'd be like, Swamp, like that. So the fire department went out, and they got their big net. So Wally was monkey barring back and forth. The firemen were running back and forth. Ms. Grunkle was driving back and forth. Fester Marker, you come down right now. And the humane officer was tracking Wally, tracking, and he fired. And he missed. And I don't mean by a little. I mean, we were a rural West Virginia hunting community. He had to quit his job, change his name, and move to Ohio. We saw that dart go up. It bounced off one of those metal beams, ricocheted, came back down, and it hit Ms. Grunkle. Oh. Right in the shoulder. And she went over like a white rhinoceros. Just bang! She was out cold. But when she fell over, she took her scooter with her, and she shot her hand locked on the throttle, so the back wheels were spinning around. We were trying to get out of the way. <laughs> Finally, finally the adults did what maybe they should have done in the first place, and they called Wally's parents. And in a couple of minutes, Wally's mom, Mrs. Spencer came running in the gym, and she did just what your adults would do if they thought you were hurt in the gym. She was looking on the floor, where's my child, what's wrong with my child? And then she looked up, and there was Wally hanging from the ceiling. And she said, Wally, what are you doing? And he said, I'm hanging from the ceiling, Mom. And she said, Wally, why don't you come down? And he said, I'm not coming down, Mom. He said, I'm not coming down until Mr. Woodcraft formally recognizes Wallace and Petuna as a country. <laughs> the winds of political change had shifted. And Mr. Woodcraft was all like, I'm not going to recognize Wallace and Petunia as a country. And Mrs. Fenstermacher, Wally's mom, she did not react in a way that the other adults anticipated or appreciated. She'd been in the Peace Corps. She was kind of a hippie. She liked a good protest. She said, you go, son! Fight for what you believe in! So Wally just did a pull-up. We went back to class. He lived up there. He lived up there for days. He was 
like a bird in a box door. Our cafeteria, our gymnasium were the same room. Sometimes you'd be walking with your tray and Wally would swing down, steal your fried chicken and go back. If he ever needed anything, he'd drop us a note. We'd sneak into school after hours. He'd lower the rope. We had a big basket tied on it. It had two little kitty cats in it. And we'd put whatever supplies he needed. He'd pull it back up. Finally, it was the night of the big gala. We were in the gym. Our adults were there. We'd eaten our foods. Kids were standing up, reciting their countries, pointing their flags, reading their reports. The girl got up to do the last several letters of the alphabet. She said, Venezuela, pointed to the flag of Venezuela. Venezuela, Vietnam, Virgin Islands, Wake Islands. And after she said Wake Islands, and pointed to the flag for the Wake Islands, but before she could say West Germany, and point to the flag for West Germany, Wally, Wallace the tuna fenstermacher, unfurled himself from the ceiling. He was hanging upside down by his knees. And he wasn't wearing nothing. <laughs> He had his underwear or whatever appropriate clothing for a school show would be on. And he had taken the paint that he had asked me to send up, and he had painted himself to look just like the flag for the country of Wallace and Petuna. It has a red background with a white cross petit in the center, the French tricolors in the corner. He was hanging there, upside down, painted like the flag for Wallace and Petuna, hanging between the flags of the Wake Islands and West Germany. The whole place went quiet. Wally's parents stood up. And I know what they were thinking. They were thinking our child is the smartest, and they were right. And then Mr. Woodcraft stood up, and he didn't say anything for a long minute. He just stared at Wally, painted like the flag for Wallace and Petuna, hang between the flags the Wake Islands in West Germany. And finally, after a long minute, Mr. Woodcraft wrapped his knuckle on the table like he was hitting a gavel on a podium. And he said, well, I guess I formally recognize Wallace and Petuna as a country. And I think what we can learn from all of this is that even a seemingly insignificant person, such as an elementary, middle, or high school student, perpetrating a seemingly mindless act while clinging to nothing more than the moral high ground, can, in fact, change the hearts of the stubborn and the minds of the ignorant. Please join us for the remainder of our festival. Go to our Facebook page or our website at MidlandStorytellingFestival.org to see the full festival schedule. Then keep it locked right here on our YouTube channel. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Tell everybody. And thank you for watching.